Hello, and welcome to the North Coast Journal Preview, where we take a look at the stories being followed in the upcoming edition of the North Coast Journal. I'm your host, Dave Frank, and I'm joined by North Coast Journal's news editor, Thad Greenson, and arts and features editor, Jennifer Fumiko Cahill. Welcome, guys. How are you doing? How are you doing? Pretty good. Um, thing like we said last week, we've got blue skies and, you know, we've got uh, the fires don't seem to be quite as devastating to our don't breathing. Don't jinx us. Don't yeah. jinx us, David. We're, we're, uh, we're doing pretty well compared, comparatively speaking. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, uh, let's dive right in and uh, tell us a little bit about what the, what's in this week's cover story. Yeah, so this week's cover story is about a, uh, a blistering report by the uh, ACLU of Northern California about the state of Native education in Humboldt County schools. Um, and so basically the, the um, report tracks um, by a d- bunch of kind of abject measures um, the disparate outcomes for Native students in, in Humboldt County schools versus their non-Native peers. Gotcha. Well, there's a lot in there. I took a look at it. And one thing I'd like to say is um, thank you so much for covering this. Um, I have spoken recently with a couple of the people that you've talked to about similar issues. And it's really, it's it's important that people understand. Um, and to help us understand, you guys have a bunch of uh, data uh, visualizations in the article that really helps. Um, is there anything you know, in general that stands out to you as like, what's what's the top line takeaway? What's like, uh, what people really need to hear about this ACLU report. Yeah, I mean, I think the the top line takeaway is that by basically every objective data point um, measure, um, Humboldt County schools are are failing Native youth, um, and it's kind of across the board. Um, so, I mean, just and the numbers are really staggering. I, you know, one thing that was shocking to me in reporting the story is how many people I talked to who basically said. I knew the numbers were terrible. I knew that that Native kids were really struggling in local schools, um, but seeing all the numbers together in one place is just crushing. Um, so I, I heard a lot of, um, you know, not surprising but completely shocking um, kind of sentiments like that. But um, you know, I think that the the three numbers that really jumped out to me um, as just kind of screaming for attention is that. Um, you know, of um, the California State University and uh, University of California systems have kind of universal entry guidelines um, that you need to take core curriculum classes and then you need to meet certain test scores and a certain grade point average. Um, And they're, you know, they were designed as the public educate the public higher education system for California, and they're really designed to to be accessible to all students. And so, for all graduates of Humboldt County high schools, um, so not all students, but all graduates, only 29% meet meet those benchmarks for UCs and CSUs, which you know honestly isn't great. Um, but when you look at Native students, it's only 8%. Um, so I mean, talking about a, a multifold uh, drop off. And then um, similarly, the state has um, education standards for English language arts and math that all students are supposed to meet, and they're they're kind of based uh, they're um, they're based on some federal guidelines, and then they're broken into four categories: that you're either not meeting the standard, you're approaching the standard, which means you're close but not quite meeting it; you've met the standard, or you're exceeding it. And so, for um, math and language arts in all in all Humboldt County schools in 2018, 2019, and this is, I believe, third grade through twelfth, so it's a, it's a huge spectrum of grades. Um, Seventy nine or fifty five percent of um, of all Humboldt County students were not meeting the standards. Um, and so it fell into one of those lower two categories. So again, that's not great, but it's 79% for native students. Um, so almost 80% of native students are falling behind in school. And that's across you know virtually all grade levels. And then if you look at the, the number of uh, native students that are exceeding state standards, it's only 5% in English and language arts, which is, is just dismal. Um, and if you look at math, it's even worse. Um, so 85% of Native students are not meeting basic state standards for, for math, um, and only 3.6% are, are exceeding them. So the, the data points themselves are just are glaring and, and really, I think, warrant um, a lot of introspection for everybody involved in, in Humboldt County schools. Um, but the really impressive, and then I guess the one other thing I'd add on the data points is the the report also does a really good job of comparing these data points to um, to state breakdowns for both statewide and then for native students statewide. And so anybody who you know is is predisposed to just say, oh well, you know, there's cultural barriers that make it so native students you know don't do as well in schools or whatnot. Um, 
you know, that's true that they're disparate, disparate outcomes statewide, but they're much narrower. Um, Humboldt County's outcomes are just the gap between them is, is, is more egregious than, than the state or white averages by far. So, uh, so this report from the ACLU, um, uh, two, two things that kind of stood out to me besides the overwhelming, you know, sensation of, of uh, despair that we need to do something different um, is one that it starts from a position of trying to frame the context of this, these disparities, but then two, it does also offer concrete solutions that mm -hmm. are goals for implementation. Do you want to talk a little bit about the history and then sort of pivot to you know the recommendations? Yeah, definitely. Um, so in talking to the people who put together this report um, from the ACLU, um, they said it was tremendously important to them that this um, be provided kind of, yeah, in the full context and the historical context. And, you know, I think they very rightfully argue that whenever you're talking about um, really kind of any any native, uh, any bench, tradition or kind of Western benchmarks for success, um, with the native peoples, that you it really all stems back to first contact, and that needs to be the context from everything else. And it's you know you can't talk about you know native success in our in our current society and culture without talking about an attempted genocide, um, really. And so, in the in the in, in when it comes to schools, you know schools were were a huge part of that government led effort to um, to really ethnically cleanse the people um, here and strip them of their culture, um, enslave them in many cases. And so the the um, report really goes back to boarding schools and and these institutions that were really designed to you know, take the native out of native people, honestly, and, and westernize them, um, make them, make them Christian students and things like that. And, um, and reinforces that for some, um, you know, current native students in Humboldt County schools, they're only a few generations removed from that reality. And so this isn't some distant past. I mean, this was happening, you know, um, less than 150 years ago. And so that kind of generational trauma is still very, very present. Um, you know, and then they talked about how kind of that, you know, that stripping of native culture um, still exists in, in most classroom curriculum today. And so when students are not just, you know, certainly when students are learning about history and learning about, say, the gold rush or the mission systems, um, they're framed in this very Western, through this very Western lens of the mission. This is how the mission systems shaped California. Um, without our true accounting that, you know, the a huge part of the mission systems was, again, you know, stripping native culture, native language and native religion from native people and really enslaving them and indoctrinating them. Um, and, you know, and the gold rush is framed as, you know, this um, this great leap forward of progress um, for Western civilization, as opposed to a land grab that, you know, came with um, a lot of murder and attempted genocide. And so um, they, they talk, a lot of the people I talked to um, about the report, and I think the report itself addresses it, but just talks about kind of how those perspectives and those realities have really been stripped from, from this curriculum that really glosses over parts of, um, of California history and local history. But then way beyond that, um, just this this culture that has been vibrant and continues to be vibrant on the North Coast and has been since time immemorial, and these various cultures um, are not present in the um, in the curriculum. And so the only time that you know students learn at all about Native cultures is through this very limited lens of history of these things that happened to Native peoples a long time ago. And there's no um, you know there's all these opportunities uh, according to people I talk to about incorporating native perspectives on everything from nutrition to uh, to physical education to environmental studies and things like that and those just aren't there and so it really serves to kind of you know marginalize um, native students and make them feel like they're not represented in in the curriculum that they're seeing um, but um, you know the report the, the people that put together the report it was also really important to them that this be a roadmap um, toward a, a more equitable education system as opposed to just kind of a um, undressing of, of local schools and um, and a condemnation of them and so um, the the report concludes first with 11 like really you know specific recommendations of how um, how local schools can do a better job of serve, serving native youth which is everything from you know more inclusive discipline practices um, not expelling kids um, not counting you know absences for religious ceremonies and things like that as unexcused absences that count against them 
um, to, you know, a curriculum reform, to inviting um, subject matter experts from the local community in to talk about Native cultures and really celebrate them. Um, so there's 11 really tangible solution or, you know, um, recommendations that I think like any superintendent or principal could look at and say there's immediate things we could do to bring these into our, our schools. Um, but then the the um, the last section of the report is actually a, a resource list, um, which is really designed for educators and parents to look at about ways to teach children about Native cultures and way to not just have, you know, the Native culture segment of, of a curriculum, but really to to bring native local native culture into every aspect of a classroom curriculum and make sure that um, you know when native students walk into a classroom they're seeing their culture celebrated with in posters and in, um, in classroom materials and, and all of that. Um, so they I think that was what struck me in you know from reading the report the first time and then actually talking to people who put it together is just how much care and how much work they put into those those last two chapters kind of the forward looking like this is how we start to address the these inequities, um, that piece of the report. Well, fantastic. Thanks. I just want to um, specifically mention uh, in the article you named Rain Marshall, who uh -huh. um, she's on the Northern California Indian Development Council, but also mm -hmm. she works with the ACLU. So she's listed as a resource uh, for she educators. Is. Yes. And yeah, she's um, kind of now that this report is out, she is the, the point person um, for schools and districts who are looking to adopt some of um, the recommendations and, and want help and want a resource to go to. Um, yeah. And I think one last thing worth mentioning is that in the past, the ACLU has been involved in lawsuits um, in our community to try to get some similar recommendations put in place um, or uh, to sort of help resolve conflicts where, you know, these policies aren't actually getting implemented. But but now this report, in theory, I think her and, her and um, a couple of the other commentators in the article mentioned that hopefully this report fuels the conversation now that, you know, in light of Black Lives Matter and people's mm -hmm. attention is hopefully going to be put, placed on these issues um, to move things forward without lawsuits. Yeah. Yeah. I, I asked Rain very explicitly about that um, because the, the last two times I remember kind of a bombshell report like this coming from the ACLU. It was about Eureka City Schools or uh, Lolita Unified School District. Mm -hmm. And they, both times they issued these scathing reports and at the same time announced that they were taking either fire, filing a federal civil rights lawsuit or filing complaints with um, with state oversight boards. And um, so I asked her kind of specifically, like, is is there another shoe coming dropping here with this report? And she said, you know, really plainly, like, no, we're hoping that this report is enough. Um, we, we believe that this is a moment in time when everybody wants to do right. Every, you know, all administrators and teachers want to do better, and we're telling them how to do it. And so we're hoping that this is enough. Well, this is great. Thank you for this article, and I look forward to talking to you more about how this evolves in the future. That sounds great, David. Uh, how about you, Jennifer? What's going on this week in the arts and feature beat? Jeez, David. Cheese. <laughs> cheese is going on. All the on. cheese, yes. And um, are you a podcast person? Do you listen to a lot of podcasts? I wish I did, but I don't. I should. I, I, you know, I actually tried that thing this week where you listen to something on like double speed. Yeah. But it was too chip monkey. I couldn't handle it. And my husband walked in the room and tried to talk to me. And he was like, can you just, can you turn that off? <laughs> yeah. But um, I know it's it's hard to make time. And sometimes, you know, the podcasts that I have my subscription to are typically newsy, political, um, and even the pop culture podcasts that I adore are, you know, always going to be like deeply political. And this week I just needed a break, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I wonder why it's going to be a rough week. It's going to be a rough week. Um, so, and it's Scorpio season. A lot is happening, David, a lot is happening. Um, but, uh, the North Coast Co-op has secretly, unbeknownst to many, but known to members, um, has started a cheese podcast wow. called Cheese the Day. And I, like I know, and apparently there were like 15 different possible somewhat punny cheese names they came up with, but I think Cheese the Day is solid. Cheese the Day is good. Yeah. yeah, and there's about, I think they just dropped the seventh uh, episode. But there's you know, a handful of them on now, but they started during the pandemic, sort of mid-pandemic. Um, they had been recording already, um, and it all started because these two cheese nerds, as they call themselves, um, 
Thomas Whelan and uh, Veronica Rudolph, who, if you go to the cheese counter at the co-op, either co-op, you know them. They head the respective cheese counters. Yeah. Yes, you've, you've seen them. Yeah, so, I saw the picture and I recognize them, definitely. You're like, it's the cheese person. Oh. So <laughs> they used to work together uh, at the same location. She, in fact, trained him. He calls her his cheese sensei. And... <laughs> You know, she taught him everything she knows, or maybe most of what she knows, about everything from cutting, wrapping, pairing, everything about cheese. And it turns out that the cutting and whatnot is tricky stuff because you can cross-contaminate a wonderful, stinky, moldy cheese, moldy in a good way, can destroy a, a cheese that's not supposed to have that mold on it. And there are all kinds of rules about how you cut this or that texture so it doesn't end up like my sad charcuterie board, which usually have sort of a little melted snowman of cheese <laughs> over in one corner. Um, so anyway, I would, you know, they should do like a cheese course. You should be able to go to cheese boot camp, like three camp or whatever. I have a cheat they, sheet from one of those I can share with you. Really? A cheese yeah. cheat sheet? Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> They used to just talk cheese 40 hours a week because when they are off duty also, what do they talk about? Cheese. More cheese. And what are they eating? More cheese. <laughs> they are down to take their work home with them. So Thomas and Veronica were always talking and their conversations would travel as cheese does onto many tangents, everything from philosophy to food, whatever. And occasionally customers, uh, coworkers would kind of stop and just kind of listen in. And now and then people would say, you guys should have a podcast. And eventually their marketing and membership manager uh, showed up and was like, why don't we actually do the podcast? Wow. And they started doing it. And they have what we call chemistry, uh, cheese chemistry. Nice. They start going and they can just... Honestly, I, I talked to them on a conference call and I could have left. They were just like chatting along about one guess. Oh, wow. Cheese. More cheese. <laughs> Even when I asked them about like, you know, your favorite cheeses, they sort of digressed and like forgot about me and we're just talking cheese <laughs> for a while. Um, but they cover all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, everything from um, there was a, a great Norwegian cheese fire. I will just let that. Let that melt into your I consciousness. I've never heard of this. Yes. And uh, Cheese Crimes is uh, one of their recent episodes, which involves a Ocean's Eleven-like heist of Whoa. thousands and thousands of wheels of Parmigiano Reggiano, which if you've ever had to buy a bunch for a cheesy recipe, you know it's not cheap. Right. Not the good stuff. Um, and, you know, they talked. we talked a little bit about how cheese will drive you to do crazy things. Um, we've all been there, right? I mean, even those among us who are, you know, mostly lactose challenged or whatever, yeah. um, there are still, there are lots of vegan and non-dairy cheeses on the market and they've been exploring those. Um, but cheese, you know, does affect your brain in the same way that other, you know, addictive substances do. And cheese... Cheese is a passion for people. And once you start, it takes more and more cheese to get that same high. <laughs> so, but they just, they sample absolutely everything they sell. So if you've, you know. They sell a lot. They sell a lot. They've got like, I think she said, depending on the cuts, somewhere around, it was between 100 and 150, depending on how you count the differences in cheese. And they know all of these cheeses. <laughs> it's kind of that? amazing. Yeah, it is. And uh, and she had some, uh, both of them actually had some tips about trying new cheeses and not getting intimidated. And their advice is eat the cheese. <laughs> I think the, the advice she shared was wild. Right? Was... Mm -hmm. So, what, um, what I don't know if you want to give it away, but. Yeah, so, yeah, should I? Well, Veronica suggested a pairing that involved a Rice Krispie treat. And as a person who, I, what is it, was it two years ago, a year ago, Fad, that you introduced me to Takis? Probably two years ago. It's been a while. It's, it's shocking to me. I went my whole life without Takis and then Takis. Thank you, Fad. 
You're welcome. So, so um, thank you. But um, oh, go ahead, it, sorry. It, it was sorry. It was fantastic. So the talkies. I'm sorry. They took me on a journey that involved at the, on the same day that Thad brought in the talkies. Um, in our marketing department, someone had been shooting a giant block of Humboldt fog. Oh, and the talkies Humboldt fog pairing changed my life. And nice. I recommend it to you all, but I don't want to spoil Veronica's gotcha. other. Yes. But check it out wow. and check out the cheese podcast because it's light and ha well, I mean, it's heavy. It's light <laughs> and fascinating. And it's just a pleasure, honestly, to listen to two people geek out on something they both really love and really know a lot about. It's wonderful. Well, right on. I'm going to check it out. Now you've piqued my interest. Um, there's another article that's in this week's edition that uh, you want to share with us before we wrap up today? Yeah, I have a seasonally appropriate um, haunted house satirical piece this week, which is about, um, I sort of imagined how I would respond to um, a haunting right now, which I'm not great with that anyway. I hear a sound, I think something, you know, is brushing against the window and it never occurs to me that it could be ghosty <laughs> until later when I'm like, huh, what was that eerie voice about? So, but I was sort of imagining in, in the year 2020, which has actually been 10 years <laughs> with everything that we've been going through, like what would a ghost actually have to threaten me with to get me out of my house? And let me tell you, they would have to throw everything at me. It's going to take <laughs> more than bleeding walls to send me out into a pandemic to send me out into voting chaos and all kinds of, you know, intimidation at ballot boxes and smoke from wildfires. I'm not going. I'm staying. And I'm sorry, ghosts. Sorry to this poltergeist. Um, yeah. I'm going nowhere. And we don't even need Ouija boards anymore. We just have Twitter, right? You can just <laughs> scroll and just scare the bejesus out of yourself. So... Life is haunting enough. To yeah, it really is. Plenty. It is. Oh, and if you have um, one more second, I'm sorry. The oh, another great piece that you should definitely read this week um, is uh, Rod Cowson has a trophy case column this week in which he talks about Karen Logan. And you're like, who is Karen Logan? <laughs> hey, Fortuna Huskies, particularly Husky women. Logan Jim is named after Karen Logan who apparently is a stellar athlete still playing golf and who in the 1970s was on these like kind of battle of the stars uh, sports shows. She designed the uh, smaller women's basketball. She played in one of the early women's professional basketball teams. She qualified for the Olympics. Oh, wow. She's apparently pals with Billie Jean King and she was a real trailblazer. And she did all this incredible stuff before Title IX, before Amazing. schools were required to have girls sports. So she'd just play. She was one of these fantastic athletes who could play anything. Um, I think basketball was where she really shone. But, um, you know, she switched to volleyball and then she switched to track. And she just kind of did amazing things everywhere um, and anywhere she could. She was just, um, as he titled the piece, uh, Born Too Soon. Because had she been, you know, at her top of her game right oh, now, who knows what she'd be doing. Total rock star. It's a great read. An influencer and a role model, I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, cool. Right on. Thanks for those two recommendations to check out. Uh, North Coast Journal on newsstands now. Check them out uh, online also. Pick one up. Stay informed. Stay entertained. Uh, Thad and Jennifer, thank you guys both so much. And take care until we connect again next week. Right on. Happy Halloween. Thanks.